A magnificent and powerful spirit still stalks the wilds of America. Almost impossible to observe in nature, its solitary ways have long been veiled in myth and mystery. Join us now as we discover the cougar, Ghost of the Rockies. Mountain lion, puma, panther, catamount. These are just some of the names for the elusive cougar, a mountain hunter with a big reputation that few will ever witness in the wild. Weighing up to 250 pounds, it can leap forward a remarkable 40 feet. And from a standing position, this cat has been observed to jump 18 feet straight up in the air. Its grace and jumping ability are skills that are critically important for hunting fleeing animals along steep mountainsides. On this edition of Explore the Wildlife Kingdom, we will get a rare and up close look at this beautiful and powerful cat and learn why it has been called the Ghost of the Rockies. For centuries, this great and powerful creature lived only in legend and imagination. Perhaps nature's most perfect hunters, they are elusive, strong, and swift. Native Americans called them Nashdoitza, spirit of the mountains. Today, they are known as cougar, puma, catamount, or panther. Solitary, mysterious, magnificent. They are Felis Concolor, the mountain lion. The mountain lion once roamed freely throughout the Americas, from the frozen latitudes of the Yukon to the tip of South America, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. With virtually no natural enemies, it was the unrivaled lord of its domain. But with the arrival of modern civilization, all that began to change, and they were forced to retreat as the American West expanded. With the coming of settlers and their livestock, the mountain lion gained an untenable reputation. It was regarded as vermin and a bounty placed on its head. For every child late for supper, for every pet that disappeared, the mountain lion was suspect. Between 1910 and 1978, more than 50,000 lions were killed for bounty or sport. The grizzly bear, the wolf, and the jaguar are all but virtually wiped out in the lower 48 states. Of the great predators, only the cougar has survived. 
Except for a few of their kind in the Florida Everglades, cougars occupy a corridor of Western America that stretches from Canada to Mexico. Only in the West is there still enough wilderness to give them sanctuary. And if they are to survive, they must do it here. Perhaps modern man has little time for the stuff of myth and legend. A lion in the forest may no longer stir our guarded souls. But the efforts of a few dedicated humans have prevailed in saving this embodiment of our native consciousness, this spirit of the mountains. Here, in Idaho's River of No Return Wilderness, over two million acres are protected by the federal government. Vast tracts of land are key to the cougar's survival, as each may claim a territory that ranges up to 150 square miles. This is also the setting for a 25-year study monitoring the cougars that call this place their home. She should be in here, and if we get right around this ridge. Dr. Maurice Hornacker, one of the world's leading experts on mountain lions, tracks the elusive animal by airplane and radio telemetry, scanning the landscape below for a radio signal. Today, Dr. Hornacker and his team locate one of their 20 study animals. He's supposed to be, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Right, here, right below the forks. Let's just work our way right down through this draw and right, okay. right in on it. Okay. Yeah, okay. They can indirectly monitor each lion from a distance, but must recapture every resident cat once a year to record its vital statistics. Dogs are used to follow the lion's scent and as they draw near, will be released to tree the cat. The only way that the men can hope to approach such an elusive subject. Once the lion is treed, the dogs are called off and leashed nearby. The first to use tranquilizer darts to subdue mountain lions, Dr. Hornacker designed the technique of apprehending them. But before drug doses were perfected, he often found himself face to face with an angry cougar 60 feet above the ground. Right on down. Right on down, Jay. Jay. Okay. Well, she looks all right from here, Jay. Okay. Well, go on. You need some slack? Yeah, a little bit. Easy. Okay, that's good. Easy. Keep it up. Easy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Right down. Beautiful. She's a husky cat, Morris. That's fine. She's fine. Easy, Jay. Just right. It's going just right. Great. Got her carry. Okay, Jay, we got her. We got him. The old radio collar must be replaced with a new one when batteries wear down. Its signal can tell Hornacker where the cat is living and if it has recently made a kill. He has come to learn that cougars may keep their well-defined territory or home range for life and will only move on if prey becomes scarce or their habitat is altered. Oh, they're great. Yeah. Little wear on the upper incisors, but otherwise they're in good shape. A little yellow. Well, that's fine. Teeth are great. Let's get the claw while we can here. Yeah. Boy, look at that dew claw. She... In good, she's in good shape. Everything here intact. Okay. Ready? Okay. okay. Go. Uh, you got her, Morris? Uh, heavy. Yeah. Hey, careful. Higher, Morris? Yeah. Higher. You got it? 112. Uh, Since 1964, Dr. Hornacker has studied cougars in the wild. Through his pioneering research, we have come to know the animal as never before. 
though there is still much to learn. Deep in the heart of Idaho's Sawtooth Mountains, a remarkable experiment is about to take place. A group of naturalists prepare for what will be an intensive two-year project. The observation of intimate mountain lion behavior impossible to witness in the wild. Filmmaker Jim Dutcher and his crew have been granted five acres of land by the U.S. Forest Service on which to conduct their study. The site includes boulders, aspen groves, open sage land, and even a stream. Joined by Dr. Hornacker, Dutcher tours the completed enclosure. Hornacker has observed cougar behavior only from a distance. Here in the enclosure, new discoveries may be made, close up. After a long and exhaustive search, the perfect feline candidate has been located. She is a 110-pound, four-year-old female cougar, and more importantly, she is pregnant. The big cat's pregnancy is the reason for Dutcher's gamble. When she does give birth, he may witness and capture on film the behavior of newborn cougar kittens as rarely seen before. A film record would prove to be an invaluable research tool for Dr. Hornacker, who in all his years of field work has never observed cougar kittens in their wild state. Raised in the company of humans, the cat pays little heed. Her previous owner had planned to sell her to a taxidermist before Dutcher granted her this new freedom. The environment must seem to her a limitless domain. How she would react to it and how it would come to change her life and the lives of those around her, only time and patience would tell. I don't see any sign of her, Jim. I didn't see her either. I searched the north side. Yeah, she's, she's, she's got to be up in the rock. Without the aid of radio telemetry, a cougar can be hard to find, even if you know one is there. Dutcher will take no chances as she still sports her claws and teeth and must be considered dangerous. With her keen eyesight and hearing, she is well aware of the crew's presence long before they spot her. One reason why cougar sightings in the wild are so rare. Finally, they see one another their first encounter. Jim rolls the camera, but no one is certain what may happen next. Drawn off by a shout, it is clear that she has little fear of humans. And then, without warning, she attacks again. Early years among people have eroded her fear of man. This, and an instinctive desire to stalk, probably led to this incident. 
But wild cougar attacks on humans are extremely rare, with fewer than eight fatalities since 1900. Because of this cougar's history and the unique circumstance of the enclosure, Dutcher is concerned for his crew and fearful that the lion may never exhibit truly natural behavior. As the weeks draw on, Dutcher and the cat develop a kind of understanding. We all had to be extremely cautious working with this cougar, knowing that she had the ability to attack and kill any one of us in a matter of seconds. But I didn't think that this is what she had in mind. For her, it was a type of game, like cat and mouse. It was a game that got too rough at times and too scary for us. It was play that could have led to an uncontrollable urge to test her skills. It is summer, and the cougar's mood has changed over the last two months. Perhaps it is drawing near the time when she will bear her young. After an average 92-day gestation period, most cougar kittens are born during warmer seasons. And then, one afternoon, the crew discovers a well-hidden den among the rocks. A litter of newborn kittens, less than 24 hours old. Helpless at birth, the mother's three male kittens are wholly dependent upon her care. They rely upon her to gather and protect them at the den, where they will spend the first two weeks of their young lives. Born with their eyes closed, they will remain sightless for the next 10 days. Within these fragile forms lives a genetic code called instinct. How much of their lives will be governed by it? And what will they learn from their mother? Only patient observation will tell. For Dr. Maurice Hornacker and Jim Dutcher, this is an exciting time. Now their study can begin in earnest, each moment filled with new insight into behavior that neither has witnessed before. Two weeks have passed since the kitten's birth, and every two or three days, the mother instinctively moves them from den to den. The kitten's spotted coat is camouflage against these same predators and sharp-eyed birds of prey. Their eyes are now open and they become alert and curious about the world around them. But they will stay close by their mother for many months to come.
Cougars communicate by vocalization, and their mother uses a specific sound to call the kittens, now five weeks old. They will soon recognize and respond to an intricate language of her growls, mews, and bird-like chirps, designed to alert them to danger or call them to food. Now, they begin to explore their vast surroundings, though never straying far from their mother's watchful eye. Cougar kittens nurse exclusively on their mother's milk for the first two months of their lives, and for four to five months thereafter will be gradually weaned to solid food. A mother cougar suckling her young, an interlude of extraordinary peace and tenderness. It is a sight perhaps never before seen in a setting such as this. Jim can only approach the mountain lion and her kittens because she has grown accustomed to his constant presence and the opportunity affords him a rare pleasure. It was the first time I ever spent any time by mm -hmm. myself with her. It was quite nice. It was right here. The kittens were just on the other side of the rock, and um, I laid down against this rock here, and she came over and just laid down next to me. <laughs> Dutcher's experience is not new to man-cougar relationships. Legendary accounts from Mexico to Argentina tell of wild pumas that helped lost travelers through the desert and rescued convicts sentenced to die in the wild. Whether true or imagined, these tales create a bond between man and mountain lion, a desire to relate with an animal that we seek to understand today. Cougars sharpen their claws on fallen trees. Razor-edged, these are retracted into sheaths when not used for climbing or grasping prey. With their enormous strength, cougars can use their jaws and sharp talons to break the neck of an elk more than five times their size. Yes, Peter? out if you get in any trouble. I'll walk over your way. The kittens are by the rocks. Um, yeah, just a second. Yeah, 10-4. Got a very friendly cat here. Down. You're giving too much attention to your kittens, huh? Dutcher's constant presence has made the cat perhaps dangerously familiar. There's a lot of force in the way she does this to me. She, um, she hears a kitten right now crying, and she'll respond to that. There's kind of a power play. She pushes against me. I'm not too sure what she's really up to. Despite their mother's familiarity with people, the kittens would remain always removed from human influence their behavior forever dictated by an innate wildness. Unaltered by the hand of man, they would live for a time in their own private world, just across the meadow.
At about eight weeks of age, cougar kittens will have their first taste of red meat. Strictly carnivorous, a cougar's favorite prey is deer. The mother has been given a roadkill, a deer accidentally killed on the highway. Wild cougars have long been blamed for depleting deer populations, but in fact, their culling of old or injured animals appears to enhance a herd's well-being. Meticulously, she removes fur from the hide and prepares the deer for them to eat. And then, she leaves the kill so that they may learn to eat for themselves. Solid food can be difficult to swallow. When they have eaten, she instinctively begins to cover the remaining carcass with dirt pine needles, and bits of wood. This behavior is innate in most solitary wild cats and is intended to hide the food from other animals and keep it fresh until the family returns to feed again in a day or so. The kittens intently watch their mother's actions. And then, surprisingly, begin to follow suit. They mimic her behavior and appear to learn a skill that will be critical to their survival. The mother will bring the kittens to feed on this deer for more than a week. There will be very little of it wasted. They will consume all but the jawbones, teeth, and hooves. For all young predator species, Perhaps the most necessary part of their education is play fighting and stalking. Mock attacks that sharpen the predatory instinct. But everything in moderation. It is autumn, and the season begins to change. The days grow shorter, and a cool breeze hints that winter may not be far away. The kittens are more active now, though always by their mother's side. She is keenly aware of their every move and watches them day and night.
Young ducks have grown up on this pond. Their wings are not mature enough for flight, and they will soon be the subject of the mother's first hunting lesson for her kittens. As before, she calls the kittens to come. And again, she cleans her kill before she turns over the fresh food to her young. For 10 months, the mother will patiently teach her kittens to eat in this way. When fighting over food, they hone competitive skills and take steps toward a life on their own. Her kittens appear more wild each passing day, more able to someday live a life in the wild and less tolerant of any human presence. Now, Jim and Maurice meet to discuss the kitten's possible future. How are they different? Well, we don't see them very much anymore. You mean they stay out of your way? They're yeah, they're, wild? They're, they're hidden. And when we do approach them, they hiss at us. And more importantly, they're learning from their mother. I think we should move right on to thinking about the next step, and that's releasing these. Cats, if they maintain this behavior. Mm -hmm. It will be many months before a plan to release these kittens into the wild can be implemented. Like programs that have successfully reintroduced the peregrine falcon, the red wolf, and the whooping crane, these kittens may be allowed to live the rest of their lives wild and free. The plan must be well constructed in order for it and the kittens to succeed. Here's the creep. Well, there are two things to consider, I think, in this operation. One is the inherent wildness of the cats, and they obviously mm -hmm. you're seeing that. Yeah. The other is we want to put them in an isolated place, as far from civilization as we can get, mm -hmm. to, to enhance their chances of survival. And plus the fact this is the least hunting in the state. Hunting will be a concern if the kittens are finally released into nature. How about you, Hugh? Cougar hunting is legal in 10 western states. Good. You, you, are you sitting on the track? Clients may come from such faraway cities as Boston and New York to try their hand at bagging a cat. Here's a big cat. Although sometime by horseback or on foot, this outfitter drives along a mountain road and looks for fresh cougar tracks. Just looking at the track right here, I'd say, boy, it's a good cat. We got us a hot lion track. When paw prints are spotted, a chase will be led by hounds. Modern radio collars even signal when a dog's head is tilted up at a treed cougar. That's good track, you. The use of the radio telemetry now helps modern hunters locate their dogs who are on the cougar's trail. 
I'd say that cougar's in bad trouble, huh? Are you? Yeah, he's in trouble now. He's in bad trouble. Go, you guys. to get that one. We're seeing more lions every year. You know, this, prior to 71, these things were hunted for bounty. And, you know, they offered a $50 bounty on them, whether it be a kitten, a female, a tom. And if a guy would treat a female with three or four kittens, he'd kill everything. Well, now we don't even try and kill the females. We usually like to let them go. And, and you know, this is the kind of animal we look for. Glad they classified him as a big game animal. The guy can only take one a year now. That's made a big difference. Uh, our deer populations are good. And the client is guaranteed a cougar in seven days. This hunt only took two. <laughs> <You're doing all laughs> Winter. It comes to the Sawtooth Range as it has for ages. For the mother lion, this winter will be a time to teach her young, now five months old, ways to survive this harshest of seasons. Although prey may still be available, cougars in winter expend more energy when they hunt. Mountain lions in the wild may die of starvation during winter if they have not developed the skills to survive. Months of ice and snow bury the Idaho wilderness, but mother and cubs survive the onslaught. Then, late in winter, tragedy occurs. Jim asks Maurice to examine the result of an unfortunate event and perhaps provide an explanation for what has taken place. One of the cubs, now eight and a half months old, and more than half the size of its mother, managed to climb over the enclosure's protective fence. In the night, it was attacked by an adult roaming male cougar and was killed. The cat dragged it to this spot? Was it yeah. killed right here? Well, over there, oh. as far as we could see. The mother watches from inside the enclosure, along with one of the two remaining cubs. Well, that neck's broken, see? Yeah. I think there's a broken leg, too. And if you roll them over, you can find. The wild male may have instinctively killed this cub, perhaps to bring the mother into estrus for mating, or the fight was over territory. But in any event, 
this inexperienced juvenile stood little chance of surviving. I suspect it was over pretty quickly, though, because that's a skilled, experienced cat. He's living on elk. Yeah. So this little guy didn't, didn't, uh, I mean, that was instantaneous there. Once that Although Jim and Maurice could piece together the parts of this disturbing puzzle, the mother could not comprehend the loss of her third cub. As she would for weeks, she tries to call the missing cat back into the enclosure. She then summons her two remaining young to feed on a dead deer brought in for them by Dutcher. Nervous that the wild male may still be in the area, they are reassured by their mother and cautiously make their way down to the kill. Instinctively, the young cub attacks the already dead deer. Further evidence of its readiness for a life in the wild. But life in the wild will not be easy. It has already claimed one of their own. This is a time of change for the project. Many long months have passed since the mother cougar's arrival, and Dutcher knows that she soon must go. Familiarity with humans prevents her release into the wild, and a decision is made to place her where she will lead a safe and comfortable life. Transported to a private game park, she would say goodbye forever to her cubs and to the greatest freedom she has ever known. She would be greatly missed but her absence will not adversely affect her young. They have parted at a time when, in nature, families normally separate. Spring. The snow has melted, and life returns again to the sawtooths. The cubs, still in the enclosure, have grown steadily and perfect their skill to hunt for themselves. Jim and Maurice agree that the time has come. The cubs are self-sufficient and can now be released. They will soon be tranquilized so that they may be safely transported to wild backcountry. Watch it, keep your feet. <laughs> Relaxed by the drug, the trip promises to be easier for the cubs than for Jim and Maurice. Each male weighs about 100 pounds, little more than half of their anticipated full weight. Ian wants the claws. Yeah, okay. It's been almost a year since I've been able to hold them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really going to miss these guys. Well, they're, they're just right for what we're doing, Jim. Boy, look at that. He's, yeah, he's well good. equipped. Yeah. Well, they're perfect for this. Show us what nutrition will do. Yeah. They're a good diet. You've done a beautiful job with them. They are capable of bringing down large prey animals for food. And Maurice feels confident that their chances of survival are good. And watch your head watch here. Watch those claws. Ooh. These, these guys have gained an awful lot. <laughs> Bigger than we thought. Jim, do this without stepping on a tail. Yeah. There you go. Can you get him up there, Jim? Watch these calls. Yeah. Good. Yep, on down. That's good. Yeah. And so, a trip to freedom begins.
Born of a captive mother and raised within a corner of their natural habitat, they are the children of a special marriage between science and nature. The cubs are transported by helicopter to a remote area of the Idaho wilderness, far from civilization. It is an area Dr. Hornacker believes to be a perfect habitat for the cubs. that way. Yeah, I think we should. Come on out, big guy. Jim prepares for the cubs' first taste of freedom. They may spend only a few days together before they roam in different directions. It is a scene all too rarely played between man and his environment, where we put back rather than take. For Jim Dutcher and Maurice Hornacker, this day will be worth months of uncertainty and setback. Today, they have done what few men in a lifetime ever hope to do, give back to nature one of the rare gifts she has given us. The mountain lion, cougar, ghost of the Rockies. Its spirit lives on today and may tomorrow in the wilds of our America and in the hearts of those who wish it so. Historically, cougars have gotten a bad rap. While the folklore about cougars has been overblown around campfires for years, confrontations between humans and cougars are rare. The cougar is not a ghost to be feared, but a spectacular cat to be admired for its beauty, grace, and hunting skills. Join us again for another edition of Explore the Wildlife Kingdom as we journey into the kingdom of creation, a place where nature tells its own story and reveals to us wildlife's incredible design. This has been an Exploration Films presentation. 